starting point for my paper is this painting by Paul de la Roche, The Assassination of the Duke de Guise, which he showed at the Salon of 1835, where it had a mixed reception. It was extremely popular with the public. It was one of those paintings that caused a crush of people all trying to see it at the same time. The Salon public was extremely taken with the eyewitness effect of the scene, the sense that you feel as if you just happened upon the aftermath of an assassination. But several critics complained that it seemed to lack a clear message or indeed any message. Essentially, they thought that it presented a striking illusion, but that it lacked conceptual content. Everyone agreed that it was a highly unusual picture. Normally in history painting, you would expect the focus to be on the human figure as the primary vehicle through which meaning was conveyed. So the figures were expected to dominate the picture space, but here they were small like little puppets or marionettes as one reviewer put it. And the whole human drama was relegated to the edges of the composition. Stephen Bann has argued convincingly for a relationship between this painting and this play based on a set of drawings by De La Roche, which I'll come to in a moment. The play is Alexandre Dumas' Henri Toi Sacour, which premiered at the Théâtre Français in 1829. So my paper considers the nature of that connection and asks how it may help us to understand this unusual picture. I'm concerned with the relationship between one play and one painting, but there is a broader issue at stake, which is the relationship between different media in this period. We tend to regard the 19th century as a period of blurred boundaries between previously distinct art forms, in this case, theatre and painting. Theatre historians refer to the picture frame stage. Similarly, art historians talk about painting that has dramatic or theatrical qualities. This has sometimes been regarded in quite a negative way, whether by theatre historians or art historians, but whatever attitude is taken, these instances are generally presented as examples of crossover between media or art forms that are essentially different and distinct from one another. And it's that way of looking at it that I'd like to interrogate with this case study. It might be useful to introduce some theoretical framework at this point, because the established way of looking at this issue is indebted to G.E. Lessing, whose influential essay on the limits of painting and poetry of 1766 proposed that the arts have essentially different capabilities, but that they may sometimes stray into each other's territories. A painting may tell a story, for instance, or a drama may have a strong spectacular aspect to it. But I think that the sense we have of increased traffic or borrowing between different media in this period is actually owing to popular demand for immediacy. That is to say, the sensation that there is no medium at all between the spectator and the image. I want to argue that what often seem like exchanges or crossovers between the different arts are in fact evidence of a common concern with immediacy, which was also an objective of the new optical entertainments such as the diorama in this period, and which continues as a feature of popular visual culture in our own time. So I need to explain a bit about the subject matter both the play and the painting are set during the French Wars of Religion in the 16th century. The painting shows the assassination in 1588 of the Duc de Guise on the orders of the king, Henri Troyes, at the Chateau of Blois. Guise had challenged the authority of Henri Troyes, and the king, in fear of Guise's power and popularity, ordered his assassination. Doloroche shows him peering in to see that his orders have been successfully carried out by his courtiers. Dumas' play concerns the same characters as those in Delaroche's painting, but at an earlier point in the story. The political power struggle between Henri Troyes and Guise 
is the backdrop for a revenge plot of Dumas' invention in which the Duc de Guise sets out to murder his wife's lover, saint Mécran, who is one of the favourites of Henri Troyes. Guise's plot is laid in Act Three, in which he coerces his wife into writing a letter to lure saint Mécran to a rendezvous by almost breaking her wrist in his iron gauntlet. Uh, which is what you see in de Verrier's uh, lithograph here. Henri Trois Accour was seen as the first successfully produced romantic play. One of its most appealing but also controversial aspects was the vivid sense it gave of a particular time and place. The characters weren't the eternal types of classical tragedy. This was a portrayal of a particular historical moment. A lot of the detail in the play is designed to emphasize this idea of historical difference by stressing the strangeness of the 16th century court. It's set in what was regarded as the feminized court of Henri III, in which the king is surrounded by his minions or favorites. The gravity of the action that takes place between Guise, his wife, and saint Megram was undercut by the frivolity of the minions who are shown engaging in uh, games of cup and ball or playing with pea shooters. There was also an emphasis on the occult in the play. This is a page from one of the surviving livrettes de mise en scène, essentially a prompt copy sketch of the opening scene, which takes place in an astrologer's chamber with all of his devices for reading the stars. In this scene, the courtiers come to consult the astrologer about their futures. So straight away, we know that this world is different from our own. They have beliefs that to a modern 19th century audience seem strange, irrational and superstitious. The final act takes place in the Duchess's chamber to which saint Megrin has been lured by Guise's trick. This is the act that De La Roche seems to have been most interested in. saint Megram arrives at the rendezvous. The Duchess warns him and uses her arm to bolt the door against Guise and his men while saint Megram makes his escape through the window. But it's too late as Guise's men are already waiting for him in the street below and the audience hear rather than see the murder. These are De La Roche's sketches showing successive moments of that final scene, together with a plan of the stage, uh, similar to those from prompt copies, which you can see at the top of the left-hand image, the little diagram. Stephen Ban thinks that De La Roche originally intended to make two pendant pictures, the assassination of the Duke de Guise and this scene from Dumas' play, but that this one was never completed. I want to stress that the drawings are not a straightforward representation of what an audience member would have seen during a performance. In Dumas' drama, the window uh, from which saint Megran jumps to his death is at the back of the room, as it's shown in Octave Tasser's uh, lithograph. Tasser has shown the window and the door closer together than they would have been on stage but their relative positions are nevertheless more true to the theatrical performance than those in De La Roche's drawings, which show saint Megrin jumping from the window to the left while Guise's men enter from a door in the back wall. But really, we have just pivoted around and the drawings do maintain the essential blocking of the scene. Um, the right-hand wall in De La Roche's sketch with the elaborate mantelpiece is the invisible fourth wall where the audience would have been in the real production. So De La Roche has imagined Dumas' mise-en-scene as a real space and imaginatively moved around it. You can see the similarities between De La Roche's drawing and the, the painting of the assassination of the Duc de Guise. Stephen Ban notes that the open window of the drawing um, corresponds exactly to the device of the open door through which the king arrives in the painting. 
Further similarities include the mantelpiece, which in the painting is to the left rather than to the right, um, and the wooden beams of the ceiling, which is quite an unusual detail to include in a painting of this date. There's also the fact that in both cases, this violent action is taking place in a bedchamber. In prompt copies for Dumas' drama, there's no reference to either a mantelpiece or a bed in this scene. So these seem to have been introduced by De La Roche and then reappear in the painting. So we can see the connection, but while several critics in 1835 made comments comparing the painting to theater, in particular to melodrama, none of them noticed a connection with Dumas and Ritois. But the way that the painting was discussed by critics does recall the sort of comments that theater critics made about the play in 1829. And in viewing the criticism of the play and the painting side by side, I hope to draw out something of the nature of the relationship between the two. So I mentioned some of the things that people found strange about the painting in 1835, such as the small figures with this big gap in the center of the composition. But it wasn't just that. Critics were looking for a lesson, something that would tell us how to understand this violent event. One of the things that people expected to see was what's referred to as a witness figure, one figure that would mediate between us and the scene and tell us how we, the viewers, are meant to understand it. But we don't see that here. The courtiers are all competing for the right to claim responsibility for having carried out the king's orders. So it's a scene of unenlightening self-interest. And then on the right, you have Giza's body awkwardly slumped, not at all the way you would expect a fallen hero or even anti-hero to be portrayed. The way it was painted also confused the critics in the sense that objects and decor were treated with the same careful attention as the figures. It had a sort of all over effect. So overall, it seemed vividly realistic, but critics felt, um, they felt that there wasn't enough direction as to what De La Roche's message was supposed to be, or even whose side he was on. Dumas' play was similarly thought to be full of striking period details, but lacking in moral direction in the sense that the power struggle in the play is between two equally flawed protagonists. The king is fatally weak, but Guise is represented as a brutal bully. But it's really striking how far both the play and the painting were perceived to consist of jarring juxtapositions and shocking contrasts of mood. In most of the reviews of the play, whether positive or negative, critics felt that it was in fact two separate dramas awkwardly spliced together. On the one hand, as implied by the title, there was a chronicle of the feminized and frivolous court of Henri Trois, while on the other, there was the tragic love story between Saint Megrin and the Duchesse de Guise. As the critic for the Journal des Débats, wrote, the drama is divided in two essentially distinct parts. On one side, childishness, idle courtiers, deceiving astrological practices, fencing matches, cup and ball games, pea shooters. On the other, a Duke de Guise, proud, vindictive. So on the one hand, there were the descriptive details of court life. And on the other, you have the murder plot the violence of which jarred with the frivolity of the backdrop. In the painting too, there's a jarring contrast of mood between the carefree attitudes of the assassins on the left and the right-hand side of the picture in which we see Guise's dead body. Art critics were struck by the easy grace of De La Roche's assassins moments after their brutal attack, as one of the critics wrote, Respectable people know how to stab a man to death without turning everything upside down in an apartment, without littering the floor with debris, without even disturbing the perfection of their toilette. And several critics of the painting felt that the mood of the picture, the impression it gave at first sight was somehow at odds with the seriousness of the action. 
The review of Furla Constitutionnelle claimed to have been wrong-footed by the painting, expect, expecting it to depict at first sight an entirely different type of subject. He wrote that, at first seeing only the elegance of the ornaments, the brilliance of the fabrics, the finesse and the coquetry of the tones, one would believe that one had entered a boudoir where some tender marquise de petit super is writing a perfumed note while complaining of her headaches and her nerves. But on looking closer, he was surprised to find neither perfumes nor love letters nor coquettes migraine, but a good and grand assassination. Another critic wrote that it is certain that this manner of painting, so fine, so melting, so precious, does not suit the subject. There's another sense in which both the play and the painting were thought to present jarring contrasts. I mentioned the fact that in the painting, the assassination takes place in the private setting of the king's bedchamber, which had some basis in historical fact, but was still unexpected for viewers of the painting. And Dumas similarly set scenes of brutality and violence in private feminized spaces, such as this scene of domestic violence, which takes place in the Duchess's oratory. So what do these similarities add up to? Do they indicate some inherent quality of theatricality in the painting? Some of the criticism of it would seem to suggest this. I've mentioned the comparisons to melodrama, for example. But if we look at criticism of Dumas play, we see that he too was accused of straying out of his sphere and engaging in a kind of stage pictorialism. The Figaro uh, critique referred to the play as a genre tableau cleverly colored and true and as brilliant and ingenious painting. Another critic wrote that there is not a play in Henri Trois. These are tableau in the modern manner, separated from each other by intervals. Essentially, this critic thought that the play lacked the connecting causality proper to drama and was in fact merely a series of pictures. So both Dumas and Delaroche were accused of straying into the realm of another art form. But I would argue that in both cases, the strategy is not to borrow from another medium, but to deliver shocks to the viewer by breaking with the rules of their own art form. This is partly to do with the reality effect created by the inclusion of supposedly trivial descriptive detail of the sort that would not usually be included in either serious drama or history painting. But in both cases, there is also this sense of jarring contrasts between the mood of the mise-en-scene or the space of the picture and the action or between the general tone of the work against which the main action takes place. This contributes to a sense of the past as strange and psychologically inaccessible. We feel that there's an insurmountable gulf between our own moment and the historical past, which is a particularly modern idea. In both cases, this sense of something unexpected lends it the power of a thing seen as if you're right there as if there's no medium at all, which is a particularly modern objective, which we first begin to see in this period in immersive entertainment, such as the panorama and the diorama. I'm coming to an end, but as a side note, I wanted to briefly touch on the issue of meaning. I mentioned that critics of the painting in 1835 didn't know whose side Delaroche was on, and Stephen Bann has speculated as to what the relationship between the play and the painting may tell us about Delaroche's intended meaning. Um, since Guise is the assassin in the play, does that mean that here he should be seen as getting his comeuppance? But for me, this is a picture about martyrdom. The visual rhyme between the crucifixion on the back wall and Guise's slumped body seems to invite that reading. Also the shaft of light from an unseen window striking Guise's body seems to have um, a transfiguring effect. And I heard an interesting paper recently on the use of focused light on stage to indicate transcendence. 
it was by uh, Pauline Noblecourt, and she was talking about this practice as a part of a paradigm shift in staging. And she was saying that by using light in this way, the spectator has the sense that the significance of a scene has been there all along, but you just needed to know how to look at it. So nothing's, nothing's moved about on stage. It's just suddenly you, you understand something you didn't before. So I think that's potentially another link with theatre, but as far as I know, it was only with the introduction of arc lights and limelights near the, the um, near a mid-century that this kind of focused effect was possible. So in this case, it may potentially have been the artist that influenced the theatre rather than the other way around. So that's just a side note, but I want to finish now by bringing this up to date because essentially, I'm proposing that we can see both Dumas and Delaroche as antecedents of a new kind of immersive visual culture that is still ongoing. This is an image from a virtual reality recreation of the assassination of the Duc de Guise, which a few years ago was an attraction at the Chateau of Blois, where the assassination actually took place and apparently drew on Delaroche's painting. So going back to Delaroche's drawing of the final scene of Henri Trois, which I showed at the start, in which Delaroche imagined the space of the play as a real space that he could move about in and take a different viewpoint within. Can we see that kind of imaginative engagement as an antecedent of the experience offered by virtual reality? Um, this particular still is really interesting because it shows the invisible fourth wall of Delaroche's painting, just as Delaroche himself showed the invisible fourth wall of Dumas, Dumas' play. So I think that that brings it full circle.